Hello, my name is Malcolm McNeil, and I'm the director of the SUAS Postgraduate Diploma in Asian Art. I'm here today to introduce you to a sample session from our online distance learning module, Asia's Art Histories. Asia's Art Histories is an immersive thematic course that covers a broad range of topics across the various artistic and cultural traditions of Asia. And it's delivered in association with the British Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum here in London. This sample teaching session is delivered by Dr. Melanie Gibson, a long-standing supporter and contributor to our programme and the editor of the Ginkgo Art Series. Within Asia's Art Histories, it falls within a week on analysing material cultures. If you'd like to find out more about Asia's Art Histories, we would love to hear from you. Please get in touch with me direct on mm133 at soas.ac.uk. Alternatively, email our team, give us a call or visit our website. Or if you want to find out more right now, please click on the link appearing on your screen for an introductory video to this programme. Otherwise, I very much hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This lecture is based on a research project that culminated in an article which I call the China Syndrome, a study of the origin of Hatai in early Ottoman ceramics. And I presented this paper at a conference in Istanbul in December 2019, in pre-pandemic days. And it was published um, in 2021 by Koch University in the 13th Animed Annual Symposium volume. But I realized that um, to speak just about this paper, which is actually quite a narrowly focused um, subject, it will probably be more interesting for you if I opened it up and um, talked about more widely about the trajectory of blue and white ceramics from Basra in the ninth century to Jing de Zhen to Istanbul, which is how I've entitled my lecture. And um, I've decided, I've divided the lecture into three parts. So we're going to spend the first part looking at the early period in Basra and Kashan, taking us up to the Mongol invasions. And then in the middle section, I'm going to look at the initial production of blue and white in Jing de Zhen and how the impact that it had on Syria and elsewhere in the Middle East. And then in my third section, we're going to really focus on the subject of my paper, which is um, how those ideas were then interpreted in ceramics in Turkey. So I want to begin by giving you a sense of how widespread um, the production of blue and white ceramics was in the Middle East. It was incredibly widespread and it stretched from Basra in the ninth century, where the, the idea first um, emerged, um, to Kashan and Raqqa. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about Kashan in the 12th century. And then we have um, a shift um, to Damascus um, in the 14th century, represented by this, and this is in direct response to Chinese imports. Um, then we have um, production in Central Asia and elsewhere in Iran, um, all through the Timurid period or the um, 15th century. Then we're actually going to look in this lecture in, at production of blue and white in Iznik um, in the 15th to 16th centuries. And um, But it goes on. Um, my lecture could continue for another hour by looking at blue and white production in Kirman and Isfahan in the 17th century, in the Safid period, and indeed in North Africa, in places like Fez, where it started being made in the late 19th century, right up to the present. The aesthetic of blue and white, the use of these two colours together, is something, it was a design choice that was made 1500, I mean, you know, 1500 years ago. Um, we find it in glass principally, where uh, the two colours could be combined, as you see on this nice little flask on the left here, where, although there are other colours as well, it's the blue and white that really sort of are very striking. And again, on this ceramic jar, where although the potters haven't, I mean, now over time, the fact that this has even survived is astonishing, but it's, it's, you can see that there's red earthenware and it's covered in, in a coating, which is supposed to um, give you a white background and then blue on top of that. So the point I'm making is that this is, this is a very, very ancient colour combination, and probably its earliest manifestation is in Western Asia. It then pops up in the 8th century, and we see it um, in the hands of um, the Tang potters working with earthenwares, um, and they are using the cobalt 
to splash onto the white surface and then to allow the, the fluidity of the cobalt to then just come down the surface of the object as it's fired. And at around the same time, or shortly thereafter, we also find potters in Basra in Iraq using the cobalt in a more graphic way. They're actually dipping paintbrushes into the cobalt, um, liquid cobalt, um, which is made from crushed cobalt ore, to paint it onto the surface. And you can see that what we've got here is a pomegranate on the right, um, a fish swimming through water weeds on the left, and here a very nice geometric pattern with um, a six-pointed star with circles at the end of the points. And so this is the difference between the approach to cobalt, which is made by the Tang potters and the Abbasid potters working in Basra. Now, interestingly, this industry of making these blue and white ceramics in these are earthenwares with the cobalt, with the white a, a tin glaze, as it's known, and the cobalt on top, is something that emerges in Iraq in the ninth century in direct response to a suddenly very affluent society. The result of the Mongol, con uh, sorry, the Islamic conquests is that we have some quite important cities arising, and here we've got a capital in Baghdad, but quite a lot of other important urban centers with affluent um, populations in them who want luxury goods. And so we suddenly have a literally an explosion of manufacturing of um, ceramics, metalwork, textiles, all kinds of things which are to, 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 to make happy this, this affluent society. And so there was no tradition um, of fine luxury glazed wares in this area before that. But the potters, because they've got a market, are scrabbling around looking for ways in which to feed this market. And they come up with the idea of making earthenwares. First of all, to get the blue on the white, you have to have the white. So they make an earthenware, and we know that the local clay is a nice yellow colour, but that's no good. It's not, the, it's not the contrast they're looking for. They're actually looking for a contrast of blue on white. So they um, start working and experimenting with local technologies, which include either um, the combination of alkali and lime, which is one that exists in Mesopotamia, or in fact, the, the, the formula they settle on, and which is going to become incredibly widespread and work its way across the whole of the Mediterranean eventually over the next succeeding centuries, is tin glaze, where you get a, you have a lead-based, a lead-fluxed glaze, and um, into it you add tin, finely crushed, and the particles sit within the glaze and give you a very nice opaque white surface. Now, as we already saw in that piece of glass from um, the pharaonic period, Cobalt was a mineral that was that was around. Um, we certainly know of mines in the Persian mountains near Kashan, where we're going to go to next. And it's even probably in a whole lot of other um, sources as well. So it was used very widely in glass um, all through the Roman period. And this very nice little mouth shaped um, perfume flask is also in cobalt glass. And so when we have as the craftsmen who are working after the Islamic conquest, they don't stop the traditions that they're working in and they carry on using cobalt. And this plate is a very nice um, example of the period in which they're, make, they're starting to make the ceramics because it was actually given as a gift um, to a, somebody in China and was eventually sealed, um, which gives us a permanent a terms post quem, a date by which it has to have been made of 874 because it's actually in the treasury of the Famen Temple in China. Now, these, the, this, the, the potters working in Basra have to, as I said, develop a whole new iconography. They have to develop the technology for making the objects, but also for um, decorating them. They don't have an existing iconography or tradition of decoration. They go to um, the, the nature, things around them. You saw the fish um, in the that bowl earlier. Here, what we've got is three bowls. Um, they're all roughly the same shape. They're relatively small with an inverted rim. They're coated in that tin glaze, which gives them this one a particularly nice, smooth white surface. And onto it, they paint a geometric kind of design, a kind of a diamond shape on its end. And issuing out of the points are these sort of palmettes, which look a little bit like date palms. And Basra was famous for its um, date palm industry. Um, and that's what we have in each case, except for here we also have some calligraphy in the centre. Now this design is very, very particular to this period in Basra. But clearly 
uh, we have a situation in which this affluent society is happy with these pieces, but actually we already have um, a situation in which imported goods and specifically imported Chinese goods are still more luxurious and more valuable. And it's in this period that we have a very splendidly um, timed shipwreck. Um, the shipwreck of the Belitung, uh, which was an Arab dhow, in other words, an Arab ship, which traveled probably from the Persian Gulf all the way up to a port in China, where it took delivery of a huge number of 55,000, I think, of Changsha ceramics, but also a number of other objects as well. And on its return trip, with all of this material coming back to the Persian Gulf, um, it founded and it was shipwrecked um, in Indonesia next to the island of Belitung. Now, I'm not going to focus on any of the rest of the cargo except for these three dishes. And I think I'm just going to flick back to the previous image, fix that, uh, th that, that diamond with the palms coming out of the ends, and then look at these three pieces. Now, these are stoneware plates made in China, um, they have a white slip and then a cobalt decoration. And it's been suggested very plausibly, I think, that these were probably samples, commercial samples that had been made in a Chinese kiln um, and commissioned by a, a merchant, possibly in Basra or in Baghdad, because these Chinese stonewares were regarded as being more valuable um, than the locally made pieces. Um, but the cobalt, too, was probably sent off to the kiln to be used. And as you can see, they're not actually that successful, but the design, the pattern must have been sent um, for the Chinese potters to copy. So we've going to leave um, Basra to one side and we're going to move to Kashan in central Iran. And Kashan is here right in the center. It's this blue dot right in the center of Iran, which is the country here. And the second blue dot is actually um, Kamsa, which is the source of the cobalt ore. And we know this from a text that was written in 1301 by um, an individual who was actually the fourth generation of a family of very distinguished potters in Kashan. He's called Abul Qasim Kashani. He actually was a bureaucrat working for the Mongol administration. And he writes a text in which he talks to about a lot of uh, technological aspects of ceramics production. And he refers to Kamsa, this where the dot is here, as a place that's close to Kashan and where the cobalt all comes from. And in fact, in tests of the Abbasid pieces that I showed you just now, they also, they have the same makeup, same formula as the um, Kamsa, as this Kamsari. So this was a, a source of cobalt for a long time. And uh, Abul Qasim refers to cobalt as Lajvad, which is the Persian word for lapis lazuli, in fact. Now, why is Kashan important? It becomes an, a, a production, a really a center of mass production of the most sophisticated luxury glaze ceramics from around the mid 12th century um, onwards for another, another 150 years or so. It's a very important actually in terms of its geography, because it's at the center of a crossroads of trade routes. So from east to west and from north to south. So it's commercially a very important place. It also becomes the home of a lot of um, very successful merchants who are exploiting these trade routes and the goods that can pass along them. Also of bureaucrats who work within the Seljuk administration, that's the um, Turkish uh, rulers who are in control in the 12th century, um, and also of um, a religious life. It's the these are these that I'm showing you here are two Kashani merchants' houses, and this is a very beautiful garden called the Fiend Garden. Again, with a very a very fine house. These are much later, but they give you a sense of how wealthy Kashan was at this time. And Kashan, um, with all of these this obvious affluent community community and merchants living there is also set within that alluvial plain in the center of Iran, so ringed by mountains, and it's got access to all of the different ingredients that are required, the clay, the wood for firing in the woods around it, and also the minerals and metals that are needed to make the pigments. And so it becomes, um, for a period of several hundred years, 150, 200 years, a really the absolute critical production center um, of the whole Islamic world. It exports its wares everywhere. And this is also predicated on uh, the body, the new 
type of ceramic body that is developed, not there, but actually in Egypt and is then um, imported into Kashan, which was generally known as stone paste or frit. And this is a body which Abul Qasim writes about. So that's how we know its ingredients. It's made out of about 10 parts of silica in the form of quartz when you're in Kashan. Elsewhere, um, sand was used. And this quartz was crushed into powder um, and then combined with one part of a glass frit, in other words, a, a melted glass, and one part of white clay. And this gives, gave the potters a much whiter body, um, and which therefore took colour, both um, in terms of its glaze. You could have wonderful glazes in turquoise and purple and cobalt blue. You could um, also use the white as a surface, almost like a canvas for a painting or paper for painting. So we've got really wonderful figural designs in many different colours of this technique. We get the development of underglaze painting, which is also very significant um, at this stage. And the craftsmen of Kashan like this blue and white combination, clearly because their clients like this combination. So I could bring up, I mean, I've chosen five examples. I could have bring, brought up 500 or more examples of this combination of cobalt on white, as you see here in this little um, conical bowl in the Sarikani collection, which has a very simple incised decoration around the inside of the rim. And then on the rim, this line of cobalt blue, which has um, leaked down in the firing, has, has um, spread into the white. Or plain blue, as you see here, or something very modern looking like these rather wonderful cobalt blue stripes on the, um, on the rounded surface of the body. But it's with underglaze painting, which is represented by these two dishes here, that the craftsmen really develop a fantastic new style. So they don't just use blue under the glaze because the blue is very fluid and um, it isn't easy to control. They use black, which is a mineral called chromite, which actually stays fixed in the firing and they combine it um, generally in stripes or um, they outline the blue with black. And so we get, they, they sort of control their, the fluidity of the cobalt by doing that. Now, production goes on um, into the Mongol invasion. So the Mongols invade uh, central Iran in around the 1220s. They are very careful to spare all the craftsmen. This was always um, their custom. They respected craftsmen very highly and they didn't want to um, kill them. They wanted them to be working for their administration. So we have an almost continuous progression of ceramic production in Kashan right until the end of the, of the Khanid period. And these two dishes, this large dish um, in the center, you can see we got the blue and, and black, and also here little patches of turquoise as well. Um, and here too, with this segmented um, bowl, which on the outside, you can see the impact of Chinese imports. These are copying lotus petals on the exterior and on the interior, again, divided, but you can see the blue and white. It's not just pure blue and white, but we do also now in this period get the introduction of tiles, um, and this is going to be um, important later on. We're going to see this is actually a great period of tile production, and this beautiful lotus is very evidently copied from its Chinese counterpart. So I'm going to um, pause for a second now because we're going to um, then go into part two, which is when I'm going to be looking at um, production in Syria and Iran. So I'm sad not to see your faces, not to know who you are. I don't know um, how much understanding you have of production of ceramics in China. But um, even from my earlier words, you, you, um, I, I wasn't able to go into great detail, but it was um, just by talking about the Belitung wreck, the notion of importing um, Chinese ceramics into going westwards and into the Middle East was very much alive in the Tang period and even more in the Sung period, the subsequent Sung period. But it was really in the period of the Yuan with the production of blue and white that we get an absolute explosion of interest in the Middle East of this ware. And that's probably because the communities of Muslims who lived all along the coastline and had done from the sort of 
definitely from the Sung period and possibly even from before when these were um, well-structured communities. It was they who were probably commissioning um, the ceramics that were made in Jing de Zhen and the blue and white wares for export. Um, and everything about these type of vessels is really made for the Western communities, the Western Muslim communities, and not for a domestic market. Um, it's thought that this production starts sometime in the 1320s. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more later on. And um, we have a very interesting um, polymath known as Ibn Battuta. He's a, he's a great academic and a, and a legal mind and a great writer. He comes from Tangiers originally, and he travels all across the Middle East. And he actually visits China in the 1340s. And when he visits the city of Guangzhou, uh, he notes um, in, his, in the book, that he, in the account that he writes, that he had a large ceramics bazaar. And he specifically says that the wares from that ceramics bazaar were exported to other provinces of China and to India and to Al-Yaman. Al-Yaman is Yemen. And of course, you can imagine that these were not necessarily single trips from one from China all the way west. They would be, you know, they would stop at various different ports. And Yemen would have been the stopping point, which then the um, the wares, the merchandise would then be taken by land or by sea on different ships um, and by land on in camel caravans all across the different regions, into Iran, into Syria, into Egypt. Now, it was long been understood that the various components of the first wares that were made in Jing de Zhen were um, sort of very much conditioned by certain aspects of um, both metalware and ceramics that were being made in the Middle East. So the very enormous shapes were designed for communal eating um, and not for not the way the Chinese eat. These were made, these were for communal eating, a large bowl of rice that was sat, that would be put in, in, in the middle of, of, of a, an eating uh, leather tablecloth um, and everybody would be, in, would be sitting around it, whether they were in Baghdad or in Tabriz or wherever. That, that, this is how people ate in the Middle East. So the large dishes in themselves were um, a shape and a form that were designed for the Middle East. And then the way in which they were decorated with concentric, so in other words, circular decoration with a, a central um, space surrounded by outer bands, which is what we've got here, that was also something that was very much being practiced. That th This is a piece from Kashan in the first half of the 14th century, but you, you already saw some pieces from Kashan even earlier in that, before the Mongol invasions, and they also were decorated in that way. And we also have metalwork. Um, this is, um, I chose a piece that was from roughly the same period as this, but we also have this, this tradition of this kind of design with a central motif and then expanding, you know, circular bands all the way around. So these elements were very much elements that were taken and transposed um, in uh, the making of this new style in, in China. But it was actually the excavations by um, Mei Huang and her husband um, at Jing de Zhen uh, when they discovered a kiln site on the site of an old cinema. And this, these are graphics of um, the sherds that came from the different levels of this excavation. And right at the bottom, they found these. So these are all broken. These were wasters. They were rejects from the kiln. Um, but when they were um, they all the different pieces were put back together again, they established that these were made with stemmed cups. And they established that the date of this level was around 1323 to 1336. Now, this is one of the restored or reconstructed um, stem cups. And you can see that it's porcelain, it's got a nice bluish, it's almost got a sort of Qingbai type bluish glaze. Um, it's got little sprigs of flowers around it. But the most interesting aspect from the point of view of who the craftsmen were who were working in Jing de Zhen on this new style of ceramic is this, which is a band of poetry. Um, so I want to show you, first of all, the kind of object that this is imitating. This is a kind of a stemmed cup, which was used for drinking. And this is a fine inlaid um, brass one. And then I also want to show you some of the, um, it with the interpretation of this, part, <coughs> excuse me, this Persian poem along the band, which is, talks about Narcissus and the lily, and it's a kind of poem to the beloved, 
which in a Persian context can indicate the beloved as in God or in the beloved as in, you know, the, the partner. We've got a, the, the uh, analysis of the cobalt showed this was Persian cobalt and that it also includes little bits of copper, which also had come from um, outside China. Now, that was, of course, these pieces were, this is the very experimental and early days of production. And um, it's not, you know, it's very, the blue is not very successful in how it's in, on, the, on the porcelain. By the time we get to maybe a decade later, we've got the most sophisticated dishes that you can imagine. Huge in size with these um, wonderful uh, decoration with a central, here we've got a central image of a lion set in a very um, lush vegetation with this kind of little open petals of the lotus all around. And I'm just going to blow up this little section here. Because the scholar, the scholar Soren Melik and Shirvani discovered that a number of these vessels, he found about four of them, had a discreetly hidden um, inscri uh, inscribed name. Here it is, um, and blown up. And he read it as Hassan Hay or Yahya Jam. So this is even, even here, this is uh, there was a tradition in Kashan of signing ceramics. It's not at all a, a, a Chinese tradition. So again, we have we can identify a Persian craftsman signing himself as he would have done, although discreetly hiding his signature in the foliage of this particular lotus petal. Now, production in Jingdezhen was huge because the market was huge. And the evidence of this market, we've got lots of different aspects of it that we can explore. One are the number of shirts that were found in various places in excavations all across the sites of the Red Sea, where these are sites where it would have been imported into. Also at Fustat, which was the kind of rubbish heap of, of the capital of Cairo, capital of the Mamluks in, from the mid 13th century onwards, and a very, very wealthy, um, urban city, an, an important city, um, which clearly liked luxury imported ceramics. We also have various examples that have popped up in Syria. This is what this one for dish here was found by John Carswell, um, in a village near Damascus. Um, these two are actually broken. They were broken vessels that were discarded in a rubbish heap um, found in the citadel of Aleppo. Um, and they were then reconstructed to a certain extent. And you can see that this is one of the type that sometimes has a secret signature um, in the lotus petals, not in this example, or at least if it was, it might have been in one of the, the missing pieces. And we then have three of the most significant collections of Yuan Blum Whites anywhere outside China. And the first one, and the one that is less, less known, at least well known, is one that um, made its way to um, India. It was possibly, um, Ibn Battuta again, tells us about a gift of ceramics that was made by the Yuan Emperor to Muhammad Ibn Tukluk, who was a ruler in Delhi, this is in the pre-Mughal period, um, in 1325 to 1351. So that would have been in the very early days of the production of these kind of wares. And in amongst, the, when they excavated this palace, which was then handed on, it was actually built by um, Muhammad Tukluk's um, son and successor, and it was destroyed in 1388 by Timur. So in the excavations that were made in this palace, they found um, huge numbers of Sherds and also semi intact pieces, 67 altogether. Unfortunately, I've never been able to see them. Um, this photograph down here is of an exhibition that was actually in, in Delhi. And interestingly, what was particularly interesting to me was that some of the pieces had been broken and then riveted together, which probably in their own time, that this would have been in the 14th century, that they were very highly valued and they were not thrown away when they were broken. They were, in, they were, you know, repaired. Now, this, as I said, is the least well-known but very fine collection of Yuan Blum Whites. The most famous collections are in the Ardebel Shrine collection. Now, the Ardebel Shrine was a collection of ceramics, of, of Chinese ceramics, that was given to a very important holy place by Shah Bas in 1608. But what he gave was a collection of ceramics. It was the Persian, the Royal Persian collection, which had started to be collected or to have been, you know, these were give, diplomatic gifts 
um, from the Timurid period, so from the early 15th century onwards. So it represented 100 years of collecting. And then amongst those, there were, as you can see, 32 yuan blue and white pieces. The collection is now mostly um, on display in Tehran. Um, there was an earthquake, and that's why all of the pieces which had been on display in all of these niches were then put on the ground. And the final collection, um, which some of you may have actually seen if you've been to Istanbul, is now on display once again in the kitchens of the top copy, the palace of the Ottomans um, in Istanbul. Um, this is just a shot of, of the very nice redisplay that they've done. And here again, we've got a substantial collection of Yuan pieces. So these three collections are, as well as the shirts, as well as um, the attached pieces, are very strong make the case even more strongly for how desirable this blue and white was um, all across the Middle East. And of course, as soon as you have very expensive luxury wares being imported, you're going to get a secondary market. Um, the Middle East was full of, of very successful, brilliant potters. So they saw these wares and they saw a commercial opportunity. They saw that it was um, that they could copy them or they could copy some of the designs um, and the shapes using local material. So they use stone paste, the body with which they're familiar. They don't have either the kiln technology or the type of um, material that the Chinese potters have access to. So they use the local material, which is stone paste, this um, highly uh, siliceous body. And um, as you can see from this pair of bottles on the screen, one made in Damascus and one made in Jingdezhen, they do a pretty good job in copying them. Although the white is never gonna be as white, um, the drawing is very fine, but the glaze is not as good. It doesn't have this glossy uh, quality and it certainly doesn't have that wonderful ring and, you know, that sort of solid ring that Chinese porcelain has. But if I was, um, if I didn't have the means to buy an imported Chinese piece, which would have been incredibly expensive, I think the bottle that I see here uh, would have done pretty well. I would have been quite pleased with myself. And so I brought up some more comparisons for you, pieces that, um, again, this was a piece that, well, well, I saw it in before the war in 2009 or something in, in Aleppo, um, uh, which is, you can see here, it's got a rather curious looking um, three pronged leaf at the bottom, which I think is a kind of imitation of the kind of banana leaf that you see here. But even though you know those are, they're quite removed from one another, the essential similarities of a central design, repeated in all cases, then a different design with scrolling flowers um, in the on the shoulder or the, the caveto of the bowl, and then a yet another different floral scroll along the rim, or here a trellis pattern. The fact of having these separations and of having even little bands with nothing in between, this is all repeated. So I think the relationship between them is very close. And you can see that at this stage, the Syrian potters are really are looking at objects such as this. And here you can see that this is a lotus pond. Here are the lotus flowers and the lotus leaves. And the artist has slightly misunderstood what's going on. We've got a bunch here with a kind of floral ribbon, but here is the lotus leaf and here are the lotus flowers. So, and here also are the long fronds, which is what you also see here. So it's clear to me that the artist of this piece had access, he had made drawings or he had seen something like this and he was copying quite closely. Because what we're going to see as time goes on is how the designs are, are very changeable and how they're transformed in the course of the, of the repetition and copying. Now, I'm, I confidently said that this was happening in Damascus, and that's because we actually have some vessels which have an inscription in the base which says Amal Dimashk. So that, in other words, in Arabic means made in, Amal is made in Damascus, Dimashk. And we also have um, excavation of a kiln site uh, right next to the eastern gate in Damascus, the Bab Sharqi. Um, and this is a waster or a reject uh, that was from that kiln. So I think we can say with some confidence, Damascus was, was, was definitely a site of production of fine ceramics. And so when these pieces were imported um, into Syria at this time, they, they, you know, they copy them directly. Now, what happens next? Well, Timur, or Tamerlane, uh, who is a Central Asian conqueror, comes in from the east, and he's very, very successful conquests of 
the whole of Iran and then going further west into Syria means that he gets to Damascus in around 1400. And like the Mongols before him, he's very keen to take all the craftsmen, to round them up and to take them back to his capital. And that's what happens. He um, takes them to Samarkand, which is his capital in Uzbekistan, the country that's now Uzbekistan. We have textual evidence of this happening because a Spanish envoy who has been sent to Samarkand to the court of Timur in 1404, he mentions in the text and the journal that he then writes that uh, Timur brought from Damascus, and I quote, craftsmen of glass and pottery known to be the best in the world. Now, um, we don't only have the textual evidence, we also have some technical evidence. Um, a series of petrographic analyses were made of sherds of blue, imitation blue and white ceramics that were found in the citadel of Samarkand. Um, somebody called Robert Mason, Professor Robert Mason, was in charge of this. He's written extensively about doing petrographic analysis on Islamic ceramics. And what he discovered was that the when he was looking at the different grains of the stone paste, that if he had been if this had been an Iranian tradition, um, the grains would have been very fine grains of crushed quartz. But in Syria, they never used quartz. They used sand as their silica component, which sometimes gives you a slightly grittier and the the actual um, the particles are, are larger than the particles of, of um, quartz. So of quartz from um, rock, you know, quartz pebbles. And um, so this this it's sand that he found in these. So that's a second bit of evidence, important bit of evidence that these craftsmen were the craftsmen that had come directly from um, um, Damascus to Samarkand and set up a workshop there. They were essentially indentured craftsmen. I'm sure they weren't there of their own free will. Um, so the piece that you see, the very nice dish that you see on the left in the VNA is a, a piece that, is, that was made in Samarkand. Unfortunately, over time, a lot of these pieces um, have, they've worn very badly and the glaze almost entirely disappears and they get a sort of, a sort of um, very powdery surface. The piece that I, I studied the entire Khalili collection and I wrote about the Timurid blue and white pieces in the Timurid collection, and this is a particularly spectacular one, this very nice jug. And you can see that by this, I'm almost certain that this was also made in Samarkand, but the type of drawing, although it may have its kind of inspiration in a Chinese landscape, has actually been become very Persian. And this is the kind of um, design of a hare and birds and these kind of trees and um, trees here and these flying birds that you would actually see in a Persian manuscript or indeed in Persian wall painting. So over time, um, the Chinese inspiration is, is altering now. And I want to show you just in this slide, just exactly the trajectory that these um, lotuses are going to go on as they pass from Jing to Zhen, where you can see here we have, I've shown you this before, the lovely lotus leaves and the flowers around them and the fronds of reeds all around them. This, when it, become, when it gets to Damascus, you saw it's actually quite a close replica, somewhat misunderstood, but um, fairly closely related. And even these little spiky leaves that you see up here are kind of very much related to these kind of spiky leaves here. So this relationship is really very close. But by the time we get to Samarkand, the relationship is beginning to get distanced. And that's because this is probably now a second or third generation of potters. This potter may have seen this dish or something very similar to it, whereas the craftsman who was making this is now working from a, a, a more distant model. You can see that the lotus flowers still have their spiky petals, just as you see them here and also here. But everything else about this dish has been somewhat altered. Now, um, Timur dies in 1405, and Samarkand is taken over, well, the new governor is his grandson, Ulugh Beg. And Ulugh Beg in 1411 decides that he is going to actually release all the craftsmen who were brought to uh, Samarkand from all the conquered territories. And this, this is, happens at, at, in 1411. And this shift outwards means that all sorts of new centers then emerge um, making this kind of Chinese-inspired, uh, Yuan-inspired blue and white wares. Or by this stage, actually, it's no longer just one. Uh, uh, Timur's successors 
um, encourage a lot of diplomatic missions with China. And we, we start to have a lot of Ming and um, blown whites coming into Iran as well. So um, Nishapur is one of the cities, and this is a very much of a, uh, a Ming-inspired uh, design with these peonies in the center. So this is an important center which goes on producing ceramics over, over a very long period. This, on the other hand, actually, I think you just about see this is the body of a dragon which curls all the way around this mashraba or drinking vessel. Um, this is made, was made in Mashhad, uh, which didn't have a particularly long history of ceramic production, but it becomes important now. And probably the most sophisticated ceramics of all are made in Tabriz, where one group of craftsmen go, where we have this fantastic, very dark, um, bright, vivid cobalt blue being used. And the craftsmen who move there are being attracted there by the patronage of the Akoyunlu and Karakoyunlu rulers who are um, wealthy, the wealthy rulers, and, and they're, they're very successful patrons. Now, um, I'm going to pause again for a moment because we're going to... Um, move to my third section, which is what happens when we have the artists moving in 1411 um, and going back to Turkey. And really, this is the section that you'll find um, uh, in more detail in the article that I wrote. Now, um, we again, we have a, a couple of bits of evidence for this shift to Turkey. And the first is um, a historian who tells us that a particular craftsman who is called Ali ibn Ilyas Ali, and he's always known as Nakash. And Nakash is the Persian word for painter or designer. So that he was, um, you know, moved from Ankara where he was brought up. That's where he was based. So after the Battle of Ankara, he was taken by Timur back to Samarkand. So he was there in, from in 1402. So for the next nine years, he works in an atelier as a designer. Um, under the patronage of the Timurid princes. And he's allowed to return in 1411. And the first evidence we have of him back in Turkey is in the construction of um, a mosque complex in Bursa, which is what you can see here on the screen. This is the interior of um, the tomb that's attached to the mosque. And it was built for a, a sultan, Mehmet I, who was an Ottoman sultan. This is before the conquest of Istanbul uh, or the conquest of Constantinople and the new capital at Istanbul. So this is, Bursa is, is a capital of the Ottomans. So it's an important city. And just down here at the base of, this is the arch of the Mihrab, the focal point of the tomb where um, a Muslim would pray towards. So it gives him the direction of Mecca. So in here, We've got, I've, I've blown it up for you. This inscri inscription in um, Arabic says that it's the work Amal, Ustadan, the masters, and here we've got the word Tabriz. So the work of the masters of Tabriz. So this is the team who accompanied Ali and worked with Ali. He was perhaps the designer doing the drawing of what was, um, you know, the kind of tiles that were going to be produced for this tomb. Um, and the masters of Tabriz are the ones who actually make the tiles and install them all around the tombs and inside the mihrab. Now, there's no evidence of blue and white here, but a few years later, Nakash Ali and his team moved to Edirne, a second capital of the Ottomans before they get to Constantinople. And this is again, another one of these complexes. This is the interior of the mosque. And I'm going to give you a detail because this is what you see all over the walls. A tessellation of hexagonal blue and white tiles with little separating turquoise triangles. Unfortunately, the white spaces that you can see are where tiles have been chipped away and stolen from the mosque. It's now, um, it's now much better, um, police, but, uh, in, at earlier times, it was, it was clearly still possible to get in and, and, and steal tiles. And I want to give you this blow up. These are some of the tiles. This, in fact, is the tile that you see down here. And I chose not all the tiles have a particularly Chinese appearance, but some of the motifs do kind of recall the kind of lotuses and lotus patterns or lotus leaves that we've seen Formally. So what we have is, again, it's a more diffused form of that. You know, the, the, we can see the, the kind of 
the origins of the Chinese inspiration, but this has now been transformed um, into something, you know, it's moved away from its origins by this stage. Now, I was looking at tiles here, and I'll just give you back the view of the whole. So we've got another mihrab, which is very similar to the mihrab we saw in Bursa with all the, the different, this is actually known as black line tiles, it's a slightly different technique, and these are the underglazed tiles, and above we've got painted decoration. And this is, as far as we know, it seems to be very close to how it would have been um, in Samarkand, in buildings in Samarkand. So let's, I'm now going to move actually away from tiles, because we don't have any evidence that Nakash Ali and his team were making anything other than tiles. But let's move to ceramic production, actual vessel production. Now, we have evidence of a place of Iznik, which is going to be, become very significant later in the Ottoman period as the headquarters and, and, and main center of glazed and product, ware production. But it's there already in the first half of the 15th century, producing Chinese inspired wares such as this dish in the Chinli kiosk in Istanbul, which, um, as you can see very clearly, does have a lotus flower here. And, but this is not on stone paste. This is a more rudimentary ware, which has got, you can see it's a very red bodied earthenware, which has been covered in a white tin glaze, and then the cobalt and the turquoise have been painted on top. And you can see it fades and it suffers, and it, it, it's, it's quite a quite rough looking, uh, you know, it suffers. It, it clearly probably wasn't even that glossy when it was first made. So how do we get from this kind of tile which is what we saw in Edirne, to um, this, which is going to be the earliest type of really fine um, glazed production in Istanbul. So, and the question is, and the question, the obvious question is, was Nakashali, was this craftsman who came, you know, who was originally a Turkish craftsman, who was then taken off to Samarkand and then comes back again, were he and his team from Tabriz in any way involved in going from here to here? Well, it seems obvious that you've got these fine crafts and making blue and white tiles. Why wouldn't they be, you know, inspiring the, the initial production of wares um, in, in a workshop in Istanbul? The fact is they weren't, or at least they may have been involved in the general idea. It may have been their expertise and the transfer of certain technologies that started this off, but they weren't directly involved because this tile is made with a different type of technology. So the frit or the crushed glass component of the stone paste in this tile was made with an alkaline flux. The flux is the, um, the addition that you need to reduce the melting temperature of, of the glass. And whereas when we get to pieces, that, the Ottoman pieces, they were made with a lead flux. So the technologies are different. But let's say that maybe Nakash Ali and his team and various other Iranian craftsmen who were working in Istanbul kind of gave the circumstances. They gave some of the technological tips that were needed for the start of production. So we can date production uh, the first production of very fine glazed wares, um, blue and white glazed wares in um, Istanbul at this stage. And I say Istanbul slash Iznik because this was um, a, something that was suggested by a scholar called Guru Nichipolu. And I think it's very much the case that in the first 20, 30 years of production, it was very much under the patronage of the court at Topkapi Sarai. The designers came from there and therefore possibly the actual production was in Istanbul. But we don't know this for certain. And Iznik is the center that eventually becomes the main production center. So it could even be Iznik um, in this period too. So this enormous, um, beautiful dish um, is dated to around 1480 to 90. And it's kind of in its shape and in its concentric circles, it does evoke um, the Chinese pieces. But on the other hand, it also doesn't. And that's because this particular scrolling pattern that you see in the center is not Chinese at all. It's based on um, silverware. And this little cup, this little wine cup, um, which has got the stamp of Sultan Bezid II, which means we can date it very precisely to between 1480 and 1512, has got this very same lovely interlace with these little serrated half palmettes and a little um Florid sort of little daisy like shape in the middle, which is sort of what we get here. So this design has been transferred from metalwork. And 
then also this kind of scroll that we see in the background here in this um, on the caveto, actually that probably comes from manuscript painting. So the the kind of actual relationship with any kind of a Chinese influence here is actually fairly remote. Although it has to be said that the very early pieces that were made in Jing Zhen tended to have this very intense use of cobalt. So the cobalt comes up very, very blackish blue. And that's clearly what we've got here as well. Now, I would say that these pieces, this bowl, this dish, and the one that I showed you just now, are both in a very experimental phase of production, when the artists and designers haven't quite figured out how best to decorate them. They're doing lots of bands of, of, of um, design, the different bands, but they've um, applied an inscription on, on this band, which is really very hard to read because it's competing with the kind of scrolled, um, floral scroll in the background. And here again, I think this is um, this kind of interlaces from a manuscript. So we've got a sort of mishmash of input um, and design input, um, but still a kind of a relationship with uh, the Chinese originals. And we particularly have the relationship on the exterior, where you can see this is um, the um, Turkish piece, the Ottoman piece, and this is the Chinese piece. And you can see that we've got this lovely scroll with flowers on it, um, which is kind of going all the way around, circumventing all around the body of the dish. And that that's copied from one to the other. Now, over the next 20 years or so, um, the designs change. Still, the blue becomes a lot paler. Um, and But still, I think, although we can identify some kind of lotus leaves in here, I would say that the relationship uh, with Chinese, any kind of Chinese prototype is still fairly remote. Uh, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of just in sort of vague idea. And it's a particular historical event that suddenly brings a huge number of Chinese porcelains um, into the treasury of the top cuppy. In 1514, um, the Ottoman Sultan Selim I marched on his enemies, um, the Safavids in Tabriz, and he successfully defeats the Safavid Shah Ismail at a battle known as the Battle of Chaldiran. And this is a kind of watershed moment. And he, as with his predecessors, the Mongols and subsequently the Timurids, he part of the booty that he brings back from the battle and from this campaign are master craftsmen who were then transplanted to Istanbul to the um, palace ateliers. And we actually know that there were 38 master craftsmen and these included painters and tile cutters. He not only brought back the individuals um, who could carry on their working under his patronage, he also, the sack of the palace in Tabriz, um, meant that he collected up at least 64 Chinese porcelains. We don't have any more detail than that, but we can assume that a lot of them were in blue and white, probably Celadons as well, and that yet more pieces were seized three years later when we have the sack of the Mamluk palaces in Cairo and Damascus. You just have to go back to my the middle section of my talk when I was talking about how popular uh, Jing de Zhen wares, you know, Yuan wares were, um, blue and white wares were in Syria and in Egypt. So uh, there's no doubt that a lot of them, unfortunately not recorded in any way, their numbers not recorded, but these then come into the treasury in top copy where they would have been available for designers to copy. So these are now two pieces, two bowls that were made in the 1520 to 1540 by craftsmen, probably from designs that were taken from pieces that had now entered into the top copy treasury. Now, Julian Rabia and Nurhan Atasoy in their um, absolute sort of key book on the study of Iznik, identify eight different Yuan and Ming designs that were introduced in this period. I'm not going to be able to show them all to you. But I'm going to focus on one, which is this lovely combination of bunches of dangling grapes um, off the vine scroll with these very nice little curling tendrils set within um, a garland of flowers. And this particular design was so popular um, in both with both in both Syria, Egypt and Iran that we have got huge numbers of this particular design of the Chinese iteration um, in the various treasuries of Ardabil and um, in the, the Ottoman treasury. And they spark off 
a huge number of copies, um, of which this is probably one of the closest. So I picked this particular one because we've got the grapes here, we've got the tendrils, um, we have quite a lot, these uh, little sprigs of flowers um, in the caveto all repeat, they kind of echo each other. But this design is then transformed over time and we get many, many, many iterations. So if you ever find yourself in the British Museum, they've got an example there. There are examples in very many different museums and they also come up for sale in lots of different auction houses. Possibly uh, the most um, pervasive design, the design that gets really becomes absolutely intrinsic to ISNIC is the idea of the kind of thrashing, wonderful, stormy, foamy sea that you see here um, in the Chinese version. So this is the Yuan version, and here we have a Ming version, where you can identify the, the sprays of water um, very clearly. Now, when this is transformed um, at Iznik, it's changed, and it's more stylized and formalized. Initially, in the first, we can sort of still sort of see sprays of water, just although they're, they're quite curiously, they turn sort of almost vegetal in the way they're, they're copied. And then eventually, the more, when we get to the big production of, with the combination of red, the kind of classic Isnik design, by the time we get to around 1550 to 1600, which is real mass production of uh, ceramic dishes, we get these kind of pebbles um, and almost pebbles and leaves. It's a long way from this to this, but this is the initial inspiration. And now I'm going to close my talk with, um, I didn't want to leave you with, I wanted to leave you with a really splendid um, combination, a sort of real synthesis of Chinese, of Persian and Turkish design, where all the different elements come together and none of them is more important than any other. Now, some of you may have been to Istanbul, and so I'm going to I'm taking you into the third courtyard of the Top Kapi Palace, the innermost sanctum, where only the Sultan and his immediate retinue would have been allowed to enter. And this is a kiosk, um, a small building that was initially built in 1527 to 28 for Suleiman, for Sultan Suleiman. But um, earthquake or fire or uh, some kind of damage meant that all of the tiles that were intended for this kiosk were then rearranged in the mid 17th century on the exterior of this building. So what you see now is not the way it was designed initially, but they managed to preserve um, as many that we don't know the tiles obviously that were damaged and didn't survive, but the ones that did are absolutely beautiful. And this detail gives you some indication of how beautiful they are. We're going to be looking now at these two panels, and this is a detail from one of them. It's exquisitely painted. The white is really the most beautiful you know, background for the different shades of blue. You can see how it's outlined in a, in a thicker line and then the shading of the interior. They're very um, difficult to photograph, unfortunately, because they are protected by perspex panels. So that's hence the kind of angle at which the photograph was taken. They're absolutely tour de force of ceramic um, production. Each tile, um, they're mirror images of each other, and there are two more um, on the other side, but I'm only going to show you these two. They measure 125 centimetres in height. That in itself is extraordinary in that they, they were managed to be fired probably very slowly and that they didn't buckle, um, they remained straight. The designs, as I said, are in mirror image. So we're looking at Chilin at the bottom and above them, this wonderful scrolling foliage with these serrated leaves and these round cabbagey blossoms, these sort of big feathery blossoms. This is a style of drawing that's known as the saz leaf. This is the saz leaf, is this serrated leaf, and the rosette. And it was a style that was perfected by an artist called Shakulu. And we know about him. We actually have a, some references to him. He originally, his nispa, or his, the part of his name that tells you where he comes from, uh, tells us that he originally came from Baghdad, but that he was trained as an artist in Tabriz. And he joined the design atelier, the Nakashane, around 1520, becoming its head in 1526, just in time to design these um, panels. And we can tell these were probably designed by him because his drawings have a very distinctive thick um, outer line, which these do too. 
And it's quite possible we have evidence that he actually painted on ceramics himself. And the incredible um, sureness of line of these pieces suggests to me that only a master could have um, could have you know produced this drawing, which is so utterly exquisite. And remember with ceramics, uh, that when you when you put the brush, when you put the pigment onto the surface, it's irrevocable. There's no turning back. This is done before the glaze is applied um, so that you have to have a very, very short hand when you're doing the painting. You, you can't have, there's no rubbing out. There's no, no, no mistakes can be rectified. Um, and it's very incredibly fine drawing, as you can see. So that's the end of my really extended review, but I'm just going to try and kind of wrap it up for you a little bit. Um, so if you cast your minds back, we started off by looking at the use of cobalt or cobalt oxide on white. This combination of using, actually being able to load up a paintbrush with the cobalt to draw a design onto white, which that notion seems to have been born in Basra in the ninth century with input from glass production because the cobalt, of course, was known from making glass. And this, this idea, which is, I mean, they're beautiful, the pieces, but they're nothing like what was then produced a couple of hundred years later, um, in fact, 300 years later in Kashan, starting from around 1150, when the craftsmen perfect um, this combination of cobalt, very often with the addition of chromite for black as, with black as well in their underglaze paint. But they also use it um, uh, as, you know, as a combination, you know, they add cobalt to uh, in, in mix of other colors as well and use it as a monochrome, um, you know, as a just to coat the surface. So th those are the early days. We then move ourselves into the post-Mongol period when we've got the initial production of fine blue and white wares in China at Jingdezhen, but for export to the West, to the markets which are to be found um, all over the Muslim world. Um, in India, as I showed you, the Tukhluk collection, in Syria and in Iran as well. And it's, the, it's that the kind of the influx of fine wares triggers this response amongst local potters who initially, who want to imitate um, this combination of colors. We no longer have any black now. We just have the blue on the white. Um, and, they, um, and they use the same motifs, the same floral motifs, the lotus particularly, but also the peony and the chrysanthemum. And they translate these into their own versions. We then have a second translation when a, a second or third generation of craftsmen gets shifted to Samarkand and their iteration, their way of dealing with these designs. And then in 1411, this kind of watershed moment when craftsmen are then allowed to leave Samarkand, they were brought there by force, essentially as war booty, um, and they're allowed to leave and to go back. And we then have this explosion of production all over the Islamic world. Um, I looked just very briefly at Nishapur and Mashhad and Tabriz, and I really concentrated on um, what was going on in Turkey. Initially, in tiles, where we saw those that whole group of tiles with um, very Chinese-inspired motifs. And actually then we have the beginning of production of blue and white in Istanbul, and the initial production of fine glazed wares in the 1480s, where it curiously doesn't have much, um, it doesn't, isn't very inspired by Chinese wares. All the inspiration comes from metalwork, in fact largely. It's just the shapes and the kind of foliated rims that remind us of the kind of Yuan production. And it's not until we have 1514 and the influx of artists coming from Iran and also actual Chinese pieces um, going into the Ottoman treasury that we then have a whole new inspiration this time coming, not just from Yuan wares, but from Ming wares as well. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this whistle-stop tour of Blue and White in the Islamic world. Thank you.